Good morning. And isn't it wonderful to sing, even with the masks? How big is our God? How big is your God? How is your spiritual life at the moment? Are you on fire with the desire to know God better and deeper? Do you feel your faith is drifting? Do you feel a developing gulf between you and Jesus? Is God just a passing thought in your mind, if that, most days? How's your prayer life? Has it become mediocre or irrelevant? Or do you crave to be in God's presence as much as possible? Do you put it off? Does it matter? These questions are serious, but they're not posed in order to provoke a guilt trip or to satisfy any curiosity on my part, but they are designed to make us think. I, for one, can identify with all of them at some time or ever, and we must be honest with ourselves and with the Father who knows our hearts. None of us likes fake news. God doesn't want fake hearts. As some of you know, I was at the Keswick Convention last week in its 146th year. Uh, it, was, it wasn't one last year, but thousands of people all, of all ages, of all backgrounds and nationalities descend on Keswick annually during the three-week convention. Some of our congregation have attended in the past and what an amazing experience it is to worship and teach, share the teaching and prayer with so many, with just one, th well, not just one thing, but one important thing in common, and that is the love of Jesus. They love Jesus. And it shows. Not everyone who attends is in that place, but everyone is welcome. And over the decades, many have begun their Christian journeys there. Even with the COVID restrictions, the masks and the heat wave, I found the wow factor. The pure joy and enthusiasm was evident in the teaching, in the prayers and in the worship. Why did I attend? Sorry, why did I mention this week? Because I attended knowing that I needed refreshment. And I felt the enthusiasm and joy of being immersed in praise, renewing my commitment and coming to a better understanding of God's word through the teaching. And because God wants his word, his joy, his love to be shared and experienced. What a privilege. Joy and enthusiasm have been in short measure in the lives of many but the joy of the Lord can be experienced even in our darkest hours. I know that. Many of us have been overwhelmed by the fallout of the pandemic, and we forget that our God is in it with us. He promised us that he will be, and he makes wonderful promises to his people, and he keeps them. It is we, his children, with short memories and doubts, and who go astray. God did not promise any of us a smooth ride through life, but he does promise to remain with us through it, and we can trust his promises. Our reading is part of a letter from Paul to the church in Ephesus, the section being the prayer for the people there. It's a powerful prayer, acknowledged partly and at the beginning by Paul's posture. He doesn't take the normal Jewish posture of standing with bowed head, but he writes, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. This in itself shows us that Paul's prayer is very intense. He earnestly desires to see the things he's praying for, for happen in the church. A kneeling or laying down face to the ground is a posture that shows complete dependence on the Father to meet our, those dire needs. 
And we can remember Jesus in Matthew 26. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Paul wanted no mistakes made as to whom his prayer is addressed before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Paul is, what Paul is getting at is that all believers, whether Jew or Gentile, are one family with one name. The Father is the Father of all who are in Christ, the Father of those who are saved. Paul is praying for the church. He's specifically praying that she would accomplish the very things which bring God glory. And this is a model for all churches back then and today. This request is like everything when it comes to living the Christian life. We cannot accomplish what God requires on our own. God requires spiritual strength, a love for one another, and a love for Christ to the degree that we alone cannot attain. And the answer to our dilemma is in God alone. He, as always, gives to his children the things he requires. Verse 16, that, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. Paul puts his heart into the prayer. He prays earnestly. Do we? Prayer is so important. And as we look to Paul and the prayer for his church, think of how we can apply it here in Biddulph. The points brought out by Paul are just as relevant in our world today. Essentially, these are the matters for which he prays for the sake of the Ephesians, that they may have inner, sp inner spiritual strength, the indwelling of Christ in their hearts, the ability to comprehend all the dimensions of spiritual realities, and the knowledge of the love of Christ. Most likely, Paul is speaking of the wonders of a multidimensional God whom he, of whom we learned earlier in Ephesians. He is a God of power, rich in mercy, lavish in his grace, and rich in wisdom. So if we look at those points, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, inner spiritual strength. And when do Christians need spiritual strength? I would say all the time. Paul was specifically asking for the Ephesians as they were enduring persecution. If they were to stand firm through this struggle, they needed supernatural spiritual strength. Today, our church members may be enduring suffering at various levels, and we can pray for them with the same spiritual power that Paul prays. We need spiritual strength when we go against temptation. We must have spiritual strength to overcome sins. We need spiritual strength to keep going through the pandemic and all that that means. And we need spiritual strength when we share with others about Jesus Christ. We should never think for a second that we're going to have just the right word to say to cause someone to become a Christian. The glory is not ours. We do it in the service of God. So how can we be strengthened? For most of us, we're strengthened and sustained by the witness of the company of believers with whom we worship, each other. Beyond that, we're strengthened by the witness of books, hymns, and those encourage us, who encourage us. Those whom we commend for their preaching, teaching, and acts of courage in society, based on Christian faith, attending Keswick or other Christian events, or taking a course. There is a lot on offer 
to continue growing, we need to be fed by his word. And his word is straight from the Bible. So may God, God grant Christ's authority in our lives. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Sometimes we could be tempted not to engage with this phrase because we might think that everyone is a believer, who is a believer, is already indwelt with Christ. You might think this statement is unimportant. However, what Paul is getting at is that we should be praying that the indwelling of Christ will affect every part of our lives. He wants Christians to pray for each other and that the influence of Christ will be seen in every corner of their lives. Christ has made us citizens and fellow heirs. We've been given the full reign in the kingdom of God, not as strangers, but as citizens. And just as we are given free reign in the Father's kingdom, so Christ must be given free reign as a permanent residence in our inmost being. He has a rightful place there and his influence must be felt. In Colossians, Paul commands us, let the word of God, sorry, the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. As we pray for this, we should see what God, that God will grant this request because we are praying for the very thing he requires. We are praying the will of God. Thirdly, may God grant a foundation of love, that you being rooted and grounded in love. It's so important that the church of Jesus Christ has love at its, in its most basic part. Have you ever walked into a church and seen love working? It's a tremendous testimony to the church's love of Christ. Or, sadly, have you ever walked into a church and sensed cold-hearted people? It happens. We as God's people are to be firmly rooted in his love, as God's love is what establishes us as believers. The love of Jesus Christ is what keeps us as church. This love, however, <clears throat> must be within the boundaries of God's word. If love leaves the shadow of God's word, then it becomes a hindrance to God's kingdom. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. One might rightly ask here, Length, breadth, length, height, and depth of what? Words usually used in physical measurement, but the passage goes on, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Many of us don't think we understand what love is, but we often fall infinitely short. Most of us take, most of the time we look at man's view of love. This view is a selfish love, which is often conditional or controlling. This type of love is what causes people to, dis, to struggle in their relationships. And don't even start me on social media or Love Island. This is far from love especially the love Jesus has shown us. And in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress 
or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Jesus' love is permanent. He doesn't love us only when we're doing what he wants us to do. He even loves us when we fall short of God's will. It's also a love that is so strong, Jesus gave up his life so that we could have access to God. Jesus' love is not self-serving, but self-sacrificing and unconditional. If you want to understand love, don't look to people. Look to the one who is a perfect example of this love, namely Jesus Christ. And the word Paul uses for knowledge doesn't mean a fact you learn, rather it is learned by, by experience. The only way I can learn from Christ's love is to experience it personally. Like the child that's told repeatedly not to touch the oven because it's hot. He doesn't fully understand until he touches it. Then the experience of a burned finger has given him a new type of knowledge. It's not an intellectual fact. He now understands it is a knowledge gained through experience. We can pray that we will all understand and experience this great love of Christ. And may God grant the fullness of himself in the passage that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Our prayer is that members of this church would be filled with God. Out of infinite resources, God will fill redeem children with himself. This is the greatest thing that God can give. As believers, this is our greatest need. And we pray, Lord, please fill us with yourself and your glory. It reminds me of Psalm 42, where the desire and the earnestness and the longing as the deer pants for flowing water streams so my so pants my soul for you o lord my soul thirsts for god for the living god and when we are filled with god the things of this world become less important we begin to think more like god thinks and we attain more more and more the mind of christ so we can pray that the lord grants those things in our church spiritual strength, rich indwelling of Christ, foundation of love, an understanding and experience of Christ's love, and the fullness of God himself. For those who have experienced churches where the love of God is tangible to overflowing, with it, what expressions of joy lead to heartfelt and enthusiastic worship to a creator God who made the universe in such impeccable design. Unless we maintain our enthusiasm, life can wear us down. A job which wasn't once challenged can become monotonous. A relationship which was once so exciting can grow stale. Sadly, a daily walk with God, which was so inspiring, can grow cold in those can grow cold in those cases other folk displaying enthusiasm can seem rather irritating but does god want us to be downhearted and negative i don't think so when i look at the verses from timothy 6 so I ask of you to make full use of the gift that God gives you when you, I placed my hands on you. And this was a letter written to Timothy by Paul, who was imprisoned. And if you read the letters of Paul from in prison, he does not lack enthusiasm. He does not lack joy. It's such a testimony. We need a daily infusion of God's word. And we need to use our gifts for the growth of God's kingdom. 
There is joy in loving and serving others in Jesus' name. After all, he came to earth to serve. Paul challenged the Christians in Rome to serve the Lord enthusiastically. A growing church thrives on all the servitude of, it, of all its members, in whatever way they can. And if God calls you, he will sustain you with all your needs. One bishop was once asked, how many people work in your church? He answered, about half of them. We have an almighty God who is vast, so vast, but who tenderly cares for all of us and who gave us salvation through the sacrifice of his only son. Paul concludes his request with a spontaneous outburst of praise. He gets caught up in the glory of the Lord and cannot help but praise him. And in Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. We serve a God who accomplishes things for his children that we've never even thought to pray about. God is so rich in mercy and power and love that he works in ways far greater than we could even comprehend. And as we pray for each other, the things mentioned in this text, we will experience God working in ways we didn't pray for and in ways we'd never thought of. As we exercise faith in Christ, we will experience unimaginable things at the hands of our Heavenly Father. Are we ready to answer the call? Or do we avert our eyes when he asks us to come forward or to volunteer? hoping that somebody else will step forward. Paul began to rejoice because he knew all these requests were in God's will and that God would grant them all to his church. So as you begin to pray these things for our church, pray in faith, knowing that these requests are God's will. And pray, knowing that our Heavenly Father will grant all he requires to his needy, adopted children. As you pray this way, you are praying a powerful prayer. Let us lift each other up every day. We must concentrate on the spiritual as well as the physical. As Christians are called to love one another, to encourage to help and to pray, God is with us. Let us learn to trust in his faithfulness, whether or not we understand. How big is your God? Is he too small? So the prayer at the end, would be verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.